the next presenter, but uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's an honor to open the IOP track at an IOP this year. Every year coming to an IOP, it's a um, fantastic venue here to meet new developers and scientists and engineers. And really appreciate the collaboration that we have with National Instruments. Uh, lots of interesting products that were announced this morning at the keynote. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk about any products today. I'm just going to talk about Internet of Things, what it means to Intel, the opportunity that we see uh, with the uh, technology that's being deployed um, across different sectors, and talk about specifically one of the pilots that we've had. So as an introduction, my name is Sharon Arabon. I'm a marketing director within the Industrial and Energy Solutions Division in Internet of Things group at Intel. So we have an IoT group uh, for the past 18 months focused on delivering end-to-end -end solutions uh, for the IoT market. And, uh, sorry, I, have, I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to be using mouse here. Um, apologies for that. So this is the agenda I have for the next 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, so please make it interactive. If you have any questions, raise your hand, and uh, you know, we can talk through it instead of waiting until the end of the presentation. So I'm going to start by defining what Internet of Things means to Intel. Everybody has a different definition of it, so let's you know, ground ourselves by that. Uh, then talk about the opportunity, the IoT opportunity. Uh, you know, we heard a lot of numbers this morning. Um, we have similar type of number. Actually, one of the numbers that I'm going to talk about is exactly the same number that Eric showed this morning. So it's a great opportunity uh, across various different verticals. Talk about the essential tenets of IoT solutions and platforms so as you go to develop solutions. Uh, for your customers uh, or deploy you know, solutions, IoT solutions in your factory or energy grid or whatever application uh, that you work on on a daily basis. What are the key and essential tenets that needs to be supported in that, in that platform to make it scalable? Um, talk about that and then some of the challenges within the industry in terms of adopting IoT as a scalable platform across applications. I'll talk about some market results, some initial results from our customer base across different segments. Uh, definitely, we believe that benefit of IoT applies to all the different verticals, not only industrial and energy, but uh, medical, transportation, retail, whatever it was as well. And then I'm going to wear my Intel as a manufacturer hat, right? We are a, in the largest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. We have uh, seven assembly test manufacturing, nine fabs, um, number of products that we ship, uh, you know, billions of units of product every year across multiple SKUs. And we've deployed IoT in our own fab, so um, in, in our own factories. Um, in essence, <coughs> we eat our own dog food and make sure that you know what we preach is really what you know uh, the benefits that we see is we see in our own factories as well. So I'm going to talk about that experience, some of the key learnings that came out of that pilot. So not specifically about uh, dollars and cents that we end up saving as part of the process, but talk about some of the key learnings. So as you think about deploying IoT in your own factories or in your own solutions some of the things that you need to consider from the get-go to make sure that uh, you know, the POC or the pilot that you're doing is successful and results in you know, uh, final deployment. All right, so the Internet of Things is intelligence everywhere. So that's a you know, quick tagline that we have. But in terms of definition, the way Intel defines Internet of Things is uh, intelligent devices generating data, uh, committing into Internet generating data that transforms into valuable information that can transform the way we work and the way we live. Uh, that's our definition, it's very holistic, but you know, some of the key things in that definition are sensors and devices at the edge, transmitting data over a network to a data center or uh, on-premise on server, doesn't need to be a data center, and creating services. Um, and that's really where, where, where the um, value of IoT comes, not just generating data. Um, and that's another thing that Eric talked about this morning, is there's plenty of data out there but only 5% of that data is being currently analyzed, right? So to truly have an IoT platform, the platform actually is going to use that data to turn into something that's meaningful for that specific use case, as well as you're able, able to provide that value and analytics and data capability to third-party companies maybe that you're working with or developers that can build solutions on top of that data and make that data meaningful. In terms of IoT, the way Intel uh, segments this market, we uh, divide it into three different domains. So we have the mobile domain on top. Uh, mobile IoT, that's basically your wearable devices, your smartphones and tablets and your cars that typically connect directly to the internet via a broadband wireless network. Um, the second domain is the home domain at the bottom, right? So you have uh, you know, your smart home, your um, uh, 
home automation system, your home energy management system, your smart appliances that they typically connect to a gateway to the internet. Uh, that's you know either a you know cable set top box or a broadband wireless router, uh, but there is always a gateway in there. And then finally, the third piece, which uh, we are very excited about, is the industrial IoT. Right? And that uh, industrial is a broad term that we use that covers you know things like medical, retail, transportation, uh, as well as other verticals. So um, and, and those devices typically also uh, work through a gateway, connect to a gateway. And the biggest reason for that is you know, a lot of these devices have been deployed many, many, many years ago, and they don't have any connectivity or security or manageability built into those devices. So typically there's a gateway that result, um, resides in there to provide that connectivity, manageability, security feature set that's required for connecting a remote device uh, to the network. Any questions on our definition here? So. Uh, we truly see IoT as the next major evolution of computing. Right? The, the first evolution started when the mainframe started to moving into uh, people's offices and homes with the PC industry that you know was kicked off in the 80s, you know, with Intel and Microsoft and a 350 billion dollar industry that exists today, with you know thousands of app developers out there that have been building solutions for this ecosystem. Then I moved into the 90s, the server business, uh, where again we went from vertical specific solutions in the server industry with Suns and Solaris and Spark and Unix systems, right, into more and more official compute platforms that lower the cost and increase the performance in the server market. Uh, late 90s is where we added feature sets like uh, ASR and DMA into our chipset. So you have a common compute and storage platforms, and that revolutionized the storage industry. In 2004, we started to work on software-defined networking and software-defined infrastructure, being able to support all four workloads in the communication industry, from the data plane, uh, packet processing, packet inspection, encryption, to control plane, to application uh, uh, processing, as well as the signal processing, on uh, uh, one you know, standard off-the-shelf um, hardware platform. Right? And that's really revolutionary in the networking industry, but bringing the cost down adding more capacity to the network so we can actually handle all the data that's generated from the IoT devices. And then the evolution actually fo follows into the Internet of Things, and that comes across different sectors, right? And, and that's really what's exciting about this. It's really the next evolution of this platform. And we think between different verticals like you know, medical, industrial, energy, there are certain elements of this end-to-end -end connectivity that's really common that we can uh, build platforms around that uh, provides that scalability and that evolution. And I think what really is interesting and is causing this sort of a, uh, us to be able to cross this chasm into IoT is three different phenomena. If you look at um, what talk, uh, Eric talked about this morning around Moore's Law and what that has done to, in terms of computing, uh, the cost of uh, computation has come down by a factor of 60x over the last decade. Uh, the cost of bandwidth has come down by a factor of 40x, and the cost of sensors have come down by a factor of 2x over the last 10 years. And I think um, th that you know makes IoT really uh, feasible uh, because there were use cases. I mean, IoT is really nothing new, uh, but uh, the use cases are nothing new. But now some of those use cases are becoming ROI positive uh, because the cost of implementation is coming down because of standards and the fact that there is. Uh, um, ample bandwidth and cheap bandwidth available, as well as cost of computing is coming down, so you can put more and more computation and intelligence into edge devices. So the opportunity, uh, you know, the number that Eric showed is 50 billion dollars. That's an IDC number. So by 2020, we predict that there are going to be 50 billion connected devices. Um, today, where we are, is 15 billion connected devices. So those 15 billion is mostly PCs and tablets and smartphones. Um, so between now and you know 2020, that's five years from now, there are going to be 35 billion new devices that are going to be connected to the network. And these are not new, brand new devices. A lot of these, actually the majority of these, are going to be legacy devices that they don't have any connectivity built into it. So that, that poses a you know, big challenge to the industry. How are we going to connect 35 billion devices or legacy devices that don't have any security, don't have any manageability or connectivity built into this? Because 30, 40 years ago, when somebody designed that box, they didn't even think about adding security to it because they never imagined that this device is going to be connected to the network. Right? So uh, that really poses a challenge to the industry as a whole. Are we going to be able to scale the solutions to get to that 
you know, 50 billion number uh, in a manageable fashion and in a fashion that really scales across the portfolio industry. But, but there again lies the opportunity for all of us here. Um, and we think that the opportunity is going to be across all the different sectors. So, uh, you know, I'm here as a manufacturer talking about manufacturing sector, but we see opportunities in transportation, in medical, in, you know, fleet, commercial fleets, smart homes, retail, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, when you look at all the use cases, IoT use cases across all these um, segments, they really boil down to three broad categories. One is uh, better efficiency, uh, you know, OPEX and, you know, CAPEX type of uh, results that you get from IoT deployment. The second one is new services and new revenue streams, right? Using data and providing that data and build a service on top of it. And the third is around user experience, better user experience. You have access to that data, you analyze that data, and you provide a better user experience. I mean, maybe that's customer service. But it really, those are the three broad categories that, that a lot of these IoT use cases across these indus uh, industrial sectors fall into those categories. And uh, and then the, the other sort of opportunity number that we look at, is this comes really from the McKinsey Global Institute that talks about the economic impact of IoT. So when you look at across industrial, energy, medical, you know, financial, retail, agriculture, and all of them are listed there, um, you know, if you add up all the benefits that are going to result from those uh, induced um, deployments, they predict that by 2025, again, that's only 10 years from now, there's going to be somewhere between three to six trillion dollars in terms of annual economic benefit from IoT, and that's a wide range, you know, three to six. But any number that has a T in front of it is big. Um, out of that three to six, about half of it, 1.2 to 3.1, um, is the economic value that's you know, being created in the industrial and energy sector. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, we believe, in those two sectors in terms of connecting these, uh, these devices to the internet analyzing the data and doing things like condition-based monitoring that we talked about this morning in the keynote to you know, be able to better predict when the other machine failure is going to happen and be able to have the spurs on hand, don't have downtime, and things like that to turn into really economic benefit for the operator of that machinery. Right? And then, um, you know, initially when I saw the numbers from McKinsey Global Institute that these have been out for about a year, 18 months now. I was a little bit skeptical to um, big numbers 10 years from now, right? But then when we did a pilot in our own manufacturing facility, I looked at the results that we got from that pilot, and, um, and I'm going to talk about that later in the presentation. And it's basically, based, uh, you know, we instrumented three tools in our factory, tool types, and, and three use cases, right? And, and the results that we got was phenomenal. And, and then I'm thinking if I extrapolate that across the 30 plus tools that we have, in every factory that Intel has. And then a number of the manufacturing companies like Intel that are around the world, you know, building anything from, and we do semiconductor, but automakers, semiconductors, consumer electronics, food and beverage, you add that up, you can, you know, fully get that to, to that three to six trillion numbers, no, no, no problem. So when I talk about some of those UK, it becomes really obvious how we're gonna get here. So getting back to those, uh, Essential tenets, and sorry about the formatting here. Essential tenets of IoT edge to cloud solutions. So, we think these five capabilities are essential in having an IoT platform that's going to scale us to that 50 billion number by 2020. And at the bottom, it really starts with the world class hardware and software security. As we talk, uh, as I said, you know, there are uh, devices out there that were you know, designed and built 20, 30 years ago, don't have any security built into that. So, how are you going to connect that to a network? without incre increasing the attack surface, right? And be able to isolate that system in a way that, uh, you know, it's, it's behind a firewall, has an application whitelisting on it, and it's you know, completely protected. You know, especially when it comes to a legacy application that you cannot just throw that legacy application and replace it with a new machine, right? Because nobody else is in that business of building an application. Second element of it is really, uh, second from the bottom, is automated discovery and provisioning of edge devices, really edge management capability. Right? We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of devices in different use cases. So if you're talking about, for example, a smart city application, where potentially you're gonna deploy uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of sensors or IP cameras across the city, um, and connecting these to an IoT gateway, aggregating the data, doing some filtering, maybe doing some you know, edge analytics on that 
NVR or DVR platform at the edge, and then sending some of that data back to the back end system. So you're talking about you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of sensors. So that's not unrealistic. But if it takes you, for example, half a day to install and provision a gateway and start sending data to the server, practically that's become a nightmare of how long does it take to go and deploy 10,000 devices, right? So that's a project that's not going to you know, get approved because you, know, you come up with a timeline and then you show it to your project manager and they're going to laugh at you because it's going to take you six years to go deploy gateways, right? So, so that automated discovery and provisioning at the edge in a scalable fashion is a key requirement you know, in our view. Uh, the third element is data normalization. Um, again, you're going to have multiple different devices, legacy devices, based on uh, you know, various protocol, uh, communication protocols from different vendors, potentially. So how do you normalize the data across all these devices to be able to run the appropriate type of analytics on that data? Uh, scalable analytics infrastructure is the fourth element. And by that, we mean being able to uh, do the right type of analytics at the right time, at the right place, across this end to end spectrum. So depending, again, on what type of use case it is. Uh, so for example, if I'm uh, comparing a data set from uh, three different manufacturing sites in you know, three different countries to see trends and identify issues, right? I want to probably do that data centrally somewhere in my data set. Uh, and that's a different type of analytics than uh, doing machine learning and you know, vibration-based condition monitoring. And I want to do that in real time closer to the edge. Right, so you need to have a really a framework that allows for both types of analytics uh, so, so you're able to do that at any time. And then finally, a service creation platform. And usually that's really an afterthought for a lot of people. They go deploy a solution, and uh, six months down the road, a year down the road, they realize that, hey, I need to provide uh, that data to additional stakeholders, whether they're third parties or internal business applications. And then they have to go build an API, right? So, here, we, we are suggesting that a service creation platform needs to be integrated as part of an IoT platform from the get-go. So basically, you're future-proofing the platform that you put into place. So as you deploy new use cases, the platform is able to support that. And I'm going to talk about an example of that um, in, in a minute. So uh, I think uh, we pretty much talked about the challenges. I, obviously, preserving infrastructure is one of the biggest challenges. Nobody's going to go rip off the manufacturing tools and floor, right, and put all IoT-capable devices, uh, you know, to replace them, right? Same thing with the smart grid, right? Nobody's going to go and kick off the existing infrastructure and put new ones. Especially in the manufacturing sector that I'm part of, right? My typical manufacturing, they want to really raise their thin margins, right? So there is not much. And historically, they've been really conservative in, in, in terms of uh, allowing new technologies to be deployed on the manufacturing floor. Right? They have a, you know, have a, uh, you know a, a certain output that they're committed to, and any unknown that comes into the, the, the picture is, a, is an unnecessary risk. So you want to preserve the infrastructure, right? So whatever IoT solution you develop has to be able to be uh, retrofitted into the existing platform. So. There's a bolt-on concept of how do you bolt-on solutions on an existing device to be able to capture that data securely and being able to run analytics on that data. Customized solution. Um, you know, Intel loves to build one product and ship millions of units. Uh, we want to do the same thing with IoT, but it, that's not going to be practically possible because we believe that every single use case is going to be a little bit different, um, even within the same industry. Um, and because of that, customized solution is required, and that really brings the importance of solution provider and system integrators into this market. Uh, because no matter whose IoT platform you're going to go deploy, at the end of the day, that end user requires some specific customized solutions for whatever application that they have. Uh, and, and that brings a big opportunity for solution providers and system integrators that are very excited about IoT and the potential there. There's going to be many devices to connect, so the IoT platform has to be flexible. Uh, in terms of hardware, you know, the number of IOs, the type of IOs you have, the type of protocol libraries that you have to be able to connect to different manufacturers, legacy platforms. And then increasing complexity, and that really comes into play when you have IT, uh, and IoT is about really the collision of in, you know, information technology, IT, and operation technology, right? And, uh, and I'm going to talk about that's one of the learnings that we found out when we did our own pilot in our own factory was around getting IT people involved from the get-go. If they're a stakeholder in this thing, and they need to provide information and be bought into the whole concept and the use case and the technology and the roadmap. That's essential. 
Uh, they come from different, two different worlds, especially in a large organization like Intel. Uh, IT team is completely different, different management structure, different goals and whatnot, right? And that typically adds to that complexity just at a, you know, even a personal level uh, when you work with them. So those are some of the challenges that we see that could, you know, obviously delay some of the deployments uh, of IoT. So here are some of the uh, use cases across different sectors. Um, and uh, the manufacturing one I'm going to talk about, but you know, starting with retail. Um, obviously, the retail, the big news the last couple of years has been around uh, fraud and security, right? In 2013, 100 million credit card numbers were stolen, right? And we were talking about companies like Target and TJ Maxx, they're big companies, they're not a mom and pop shop that you didn't turn on the firewall on the network, or uh, you know, we're talking about big companies with big IT departments that were prone to pass. So in this case, we actually worked with NCR, which is one of our OEM customers in retail, on developing a solution called uh, Data Protection Technology, DPT. And what DPT does is really um, isolates the um, um, sensitive data, like your driver license and your social security number, as well as the transaction data, by um, having it isolated, completely isolated from the OS and the CPU, uh, both physically and logically, using a, a separate, um, uh, using a, the trusted platform, um, uh, trusted platform uh, technology, platform technology. Um, and that really, at the end of the day, it results in, in terms of monetary benefits to the retailer, is really um, the financial cost of viability that comes with having your, you know, your consumer, customer data stolen, as well as the, you know, the brand uh, value that, that, that protects, right, in terms of not having your name show up on CNN and Fox News, right? Um, the second use case is around a smart parking solution, right? This is really around smart cities. Um, you know, of course, urbanization has a lot of benefits, uh, but it has a lot of downsides like pollution and noise and crime. And traffic is one of the downsides of urbanization. So in this case, we work with a customer in Europe, and what they wanted to do is use IoT to, uh, you know, uh, save people from searching for empty parking spots in the downtown area. So what they did is they implemented sensors on top of light posts around the, you know, in the core downtown, which was monitoring the, the space below the light posts and sending that data back to the, you know, the city data center. And then that data was provided uh, to an application on a smart mobile phone as well as to navigation systems. And a driver you know, driving downtown could actually log into the application and see where empty spots are instead of going around and circling and trying to look for an empty spot. And you know, that reduced the uh, searching time by about 43%. Obviously, better user experience in this case for, for the drivers and you know, less congestion in the city, so it's a better experience also for the city plan. After that, they actually tie that into the parking enforcer application that they have. So they built this application for parking enforcers. So instead of the parking cops going around and looking for expired meters, they actually know which meter is expired and they can go directly in put a ticket their parking ticket there. Um, what they did actually when they deployed this IoT platform, they had enabled API management capability, that service creation platform as well. So uh, three months down the road, they, somebody in, 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 in that uh, sort of company came up with this brilliant idea, maybe we can actually tie this with some of the merchants in downtown area in providing uh, location-based coupons to customers that are using the app, right? So monetizing the IoT platform that they already had, right? So imagine driving downtown Austin, going to the dentist appointment, you find your parking spot, you park, and then you get a mobile coupon because you know the system knows your location. And you obviously have to opt in into that service. Uh, you get a coupon for you know Starbucks, two dollars off at uh, the breakfast time. So that's the type of use case that they have very good for. The third use case is uh, really around uh, transportation. And in this case, we work with a partner called Dynamics that's in the business of providing individualized di drivers coaching and um, uh, transportation fleet maintenance systems and their end customer, Sia Trucking, which is a big commercial trucking uh, customer in, in the US, uh, was looking at uh, providing coaching um, for their drivers in order to um, reduce uh, fuel consumption. So they built a system that aggregates data from uh, hundreds of sensors that are um, spread across a, a commercial truck uh, and provide that data in terms of uh, driver coaching in real time on a monitor to the driver. So they do things like progressive <coughs> shifting uh, that you know, saves uh, fuel, as well as you know, providing data to the maintenance crew 
in the truck yard, so at night when you know the driver parks the truck, they know exactly what they need to service as opposed to wasting the time trying to diagnose what the problems are. Uh, so that's resulted into about 6% in fuel savings for this company. Right? So if you consider that in the US alone, 50 billion gallons of gas is used every year in commercial trucking, and you know, sort of extrapolates, you know, 6% of that is about 3.3 billion gallons of gas, which translates into 38 million tons of CO2 that we're avoided, right? So these are real benefits. And then the last one is really a smart building solution. Uh, in this case, we work with Rudin, which is a big uh, building management company out of New York City. Uh, they manage big buildings of, you know, 1 million plus square feet. And they basically build an IoT solution that integrates sensor data from different systems. They have a building management system, they have an HVAC system, heating, ventilation, AC system. Uh, they have an access to separate access system. So all that data is aggregated into an IoT gateway and connected to the Rudin's backend management system. Uh, they built a system called BOSS, that's that B O S S, that stands for Building Operate, Operating System Solution, that allows the building manager to have access to all the different systems as well as uh, deploy analytics to optimize things like uh, en energy conservation, right? So if they realize that part of a floor is empty and there's nobody there moving, right? Uh, you know, turn the AC off or you know, turn the lighting off. And that's really resulted into big savings for them as well as better comfort for um, you know, their occupants. So now, uh, so switching now to manufacturing. So, uh, uh, you know, Intel, largest silicon manufacturer in the world. Uh, if you can read the numbers, you know, some of the big numbers that we put here to impress you. Uh, but, you know, we have seven assembly test facilities, nine fabs in four countries. We ship over 1.1 billion products every year. Um, and that's across 5,275 SKUs. So very complex, right? Uh, in terms of our supply chain, we have 10,000 suppliers in 100 countries and we ship our products to 68 countries, right? So very complex uh, supply chain uh, management problem that we have. And, um, and I don't want to brag, but you know, we've been typically uh, on a consistent basis one generation ahead of other uh, silicon manufacturers in terms of our uh, capabilities around the geometries that we use and the size of the wafers and 3D uh, capability for our transistors and whatnot, right? And we do that while maintaining the highest gross margins in the industry. Now, we've been able to do that because obviously Intel is a big company, we have big R&D budgets, our manufacturing, uh, technology manufacturing group, to get a big chunk of that R&D budget in order to optimize our manufacturing, our supply chain, right? And we, over the last decade or so, we've been building IoT capability into our solution, right? Now, these are all custom made Intel IoT capability that we didn't call them IoT, but in essence, after 10 years, our whole manufacturing floor is entirely connected to our enterprise system and across our supply chain. So this is something that we built ourselves. Every tool that we have has a platform connected to it called the station controller that, in essence, is really an IoT gateway that connects that tool, uh, the data, the log files, everything that happens with that tool, the process, as well as the product that goes in there in terms of you know, who was a technician working on this product, right? So you can track, trace everything back to an individual SKU at any time if there's an issue. So we built that ourselves. Obviously, it costs a lot of money, right? to be able to do that. But that actually resulted in the benefits that you know, we've been able to maintain. But now with you know, our IoT platform, um, we've been also deploying specific use cases that I'm gonna talk about here that allowed us to even now eke out more benefits and gains out of, uh, out of our manufacturing floor. So, um, so really, uh, we started a, a pilot, and, and just like any other company, no different, you know, we really started initially with a POC, a proof of concept. Uh, in this case, it really came out with you know, our uh, Malaysian team, an assembly test manufacturing team, where one of the uh, tool owners um, had an idea about why one of the tools was uh, sort of malfunctioning once in a while, and what potentially was, was a, uh, sort of the root cause of that platform, right? So he deployed a proof of concept, it, it actually worked, and he presented it to his management, as well as finance, right, to show that, hey, you know, if we go fix this thing, there is a payback for us, right? So that POC was successful, and it resulted into a pilot, right? And, um, and then we went and, we, again, we included finance, and this time we brought in IT, right, because now we want to go do a pilot of this solution on a live network, right? And uh, we brought... Uh, 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 data scientists to the picture as well, because we know at the end of the day they have to build the data models to be able to do the analytics, right? So 
we brought in all the stakeholders. We mapped out what we wanted to do over uh, an 18-month period and got approval to get investment to go deploy this pilot. And the pilot was successful. And now we're going through commercial deployment of this across all of Intel's uh, assembly test manufacturing for those two, uh, three full times that we've done. I'm going to talk about it. But uh, the, the point I wanted to make is if you're a solution provider, right, you see all the numbers, IoT numbers out there, we get excited about it, right? But with, as you engage with end users, right, there's going to be a process for them that they're going to go through it. And you have to be willing to help them across, you know, um, along that process from deploying a POC, seeing the results, getting to a pilot system, and then moving on into a commercial robot. This is not going to happen overnight. And in some of the industries, it's going to be longer than others. Right? Some of the industries are more regulated. You have to go through certification, uh, and uh, you, know, you have to get approval. So that, that even takes longer. But some of the other industries that are not regulated, it's, it's going to go much quicker. And uh, as an example, uh, you know, being in Texas, right, oil and gas industry is one of the industries that's really ramping up on IoT use cases. Right? Uh, we looked at oil and gas industry. I looked at it personally about four or five years ago. And IoT use cases were very limited. But now with uh, uh, oil prices being at you know, less than 50 bucks a barrel, um, a lot of oil and gas companies are now looking at drilling new holes, right? But they're looking at how do I make the production of the oil that's coming out of the existing holes that I have more efficient? And how do I extend the life of that reservoir by extracting oil more intelligently and run analytics, right? And all of a sudden, you know, we're getting a boom here where people are deploying IoT capability uh, very fast, right? So that's an example of how things, some of the things will go slower versus others, right? So um, in terms of our experience, um, let's talk about the teams that were involved. So we had the factory engineers involved. They're the tool owners. They have a suspicious of areas that uh, we can potentially go and add more efficiency to the platform. Um, so they're obviously an, an, an owner here. Manufacturing IT, um, IT needs to be, again, involved from the get-go. Um, get their buy-in, uh, get them buy-in to the solution that you want to use. Um, and make sure that you have a roadmap that allows you to extend this capability over time. Um, data scientists or statistician, obviously you get the access to the data from the tools. Uh, we heard this morning only 5% of the data is being analyzed today, and that's part of the problem is, you know, having access to uh, data scientists and decisions that come and you know, build data models for you. And then uh, one element that I didn't then put on the slide here, but it's critical, is, is uh, especially in, in, at Intel, because Intel is run by finance, have somebody from finance involved in, into this as well. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing a POC or pilot, you have to get management buy-in to go roll that up. And if you have a financial analysis done on that use case, it's much easier to get buy-in. So, Finance is a uh, critical uh, key member as well. In terms of uh, success indicators, and these are the sort of the success indicators that comes from our uh, manufacturing group. These are not mine, but what they, they were looking at is an ROI, clear business value. And that's really where finance comes in to do the uh, sort of the ROI analysis and see what is the MPV of a uh, specific use case that I'm going to go before. Uh, another indicator was around using solutions that are based on open standards, so we didn't want to do anything proprietary that you know, gets you locked into a specific vendor, um, as well as solutions that are pro proliferation ready, so they're commercial products. So you do the pilot based on commercial product, if it's a go, you want to go deploy, you don't want to wait a couple of years because you use the prototype solutions from someone and now you have to wait for them to actually build the product, right? So that was one of the you know, success indicators for them. And then outsourcing where necessary because definitely we don't have all the skill sets and know-how within Intel. Uh, you have to have partners here and then prioritizing the skill sets and know-how because as we know, there are use cases that are going to come up that we have no idea today. And you, know, you don't need to have the learnings and the skill set from the original use cases to be able to learn from them and to deploy later on. So these are the uh, three tools uh, in our assembly test manufacturing that were part of this IoT pilot. Um, Automated tester, um, which is uh, basically an automated testing equipment, as, as it said. Uh, there's a handler in the system that actually takes multiple CPUs and puts them on the motherboard for testing. And um, the handler, once in a while, uh, it misaligns, right? And it, what it does, it damages the CPU, so you have to scrap that silicon. And it damages the motherboard, right? So you have to scrap the motherboard. So those are some of the scrap expenses that goes with that. Then you have to stop the line, right? And it typically takes an eight-hour shift to service and align that test equipment, right? So there is 
some yield loss associated with the stopping of that line, right? So that, that's one tool, you know, a specific use case around uh, the automated tester. The second tool is an assembly tool. Uh, this is a tool, it's a multi-component tool. Um, it's a ball attached module is a piece of it, which actually attaches solder balls to the VGA package, right? And once in a while you have a, a, a CPU that doesn't have, so that has uh, missing, um, missing balls. And um, um, that was one of the use cases we wanted to predict when that, that occurrence is going to happen. Um, and then the third uh, tool was a vision system, which is also used for testing. It takes uh, high definition images of our packages uh, at the end of the line, right, and defines what are good, what is a bad, and so we're going to need to be scrapped. And then there's a series of products that are classified as marginal. And before this pilot, that bundle of marginal products were moved into a different um, sort of area within our assembly test manufacturing for somebody to actually go manually inspect these and see which ones are good, which ones are bad, right? And that obviously takes a lot of time and effort to do that. So these were the three tools and the use cases there. And then in terms of benefits, uh, on the automated tester, uh, we looked at 50% uh, reduction in maintenance time uh, <laughs> by getting the data and being able to predict when uh, that misalignment on the uh, tester handle is gonna happen. And 20% uh, uh, reduction in spare uh, costs and 25% reduction in non-genuine yield, yield loss, right? So, and depending on what kind of silicon we're producing, right, whether it's a $400 Xeon CPU, right, that could be really, uh, you know, big tangible numbers in terms of uh, NPV. Uh, use case number two, we saw a 50% reduction in yield losses by being able to, you know, we, we determined there is a correlation between the vacuum pressure on the nozzle uh, with the missing balls, right? And being able to predict when that's going to happen has allowed us to reduce our yield loss by 50%. And then on the vision system, uh, by automating that last piece, uh, uh, you know, uh, running standard R algorithms on the data set that we're getting from those uh, high definition images, we're able to do that uh, secondary uh, testing much more faster. And we got 10 times faster results and 10% headcount efficiency, right? So that results in real dollars. And if you want more details about uh, the actual implementation of the use cases and what was deployed, uh, come and see me afterwards. There's a white paper on the Intel website that, that talks about the uh, solution and what we deployed. But the key so, uh, really um, uh, thing that I wanted to emphasize here, we deployed one IoT infrastructure here in terms of uh, the gateway platform, the backend industrial data center, the data, the big data infrastructure in terms of software. Uh, that we need to uh, put in there, and as well as the analytics framework. And that same infrastructure was supporting all three use cases. And that uh, infrastructure is what we believe is going to support our future use cases. So we're already working on use case number four and five that are being piloted right now, right? So we don't intend to go for every use case go and implement the new end-to-end -end solutions, right? And that's uh, really the benefits of the scalability of an IoT platform if it meets those five essential tenets of IoT. So the key learnings really, um, really IoT, uh, any IoT uh, use case starts with uh, a, a new business value, right? I mean, that could be, you know, better yields, uh, less scrap, you know, headcount efficiency, or business value in terms of a new services revenue. Right? In, that, in, in the case of that uh, uh, smart parking example that I gave you, right, it was really the new service that they were enabling with the, with the mobile coupons, right? Obviously, they got to do some revenue type of sharing with the merchants there, and that's, you know, you know, that's a new business value for that entity. Uh, scalability and flexibility is key, right? And I talked about it in, in the previous slide, right? The, make, making sure that the platform that you deploy is allowed you to scale. Because that's a, that's a thing that's exciting about IoT in my view is there are so many use cases that we haven't even thought about that, that's really gonna transform the way we do business and the way we live our lives, right? And, and you have to make sure that whatever you deploy today is gonna be able, to, it's gonna be future proof. Uh, Cross-functional expertise is key in any pilot that you're going to do. Uh, it, that was definitely key in, in our uh, in our manufacturing experience in bringing in uh, you know somebody from the factory floor that understands the tool, understands the process, understands the products that you're going in, has a thesis in his head around how things are related. Uh, the, the second use is around the ball attached a module. The, the tool owner thought that you know, the vacuum pressure had something to do with this thing balls, right? Uh, so that, that's one expertise that you need. The IT, um, again, I'm emphasizing that because a lot of people 
don't involve IT from the get-go. I think any success of any IoT de deployment is going to result in having IT there. Um, and uh, as well as, you know, obviously the data scientists there and, and finance. Um, implement implementation complexity. So that's, you know, we talked about that. Uh, that really comes into play, especially when you have a lot of legacy <coughs> devices, where in some cases we have customers who are, you know, implementing solutions where the OEM for that device does, doesn't even exist anymore, right? They're bankrupt or, you know, they, you know, they got bought on a few times and there's no documentation, no access to anything related to that tool, right? And that tool needs to not come to get connected, right? So there's a lot of complexity there. But as well, there's a lot of opportunities for, for system integrators and solution providers. And then partnership and collaboration is key, right? I don't think there's any company that has an end-to-end -end platform that's going to meet the requirement of any solution. So, um, and that, that's key in terms of you know, making sure that uh, whatever platform that we're going to deliver is scalable across multiple different um, use cases across different segments. So um, just to summarize quickly, right, we definitely uh, at Intel, we're very excited about IoT. Uh, you know, we uh, think that there are five key tenets that we talked about uh, around uh, hardware software security, edge management capability, data normalization, a scalable analytics infrastructure, and a service creation platform are key features of any IoT platform that is going to scale and be successful uh, to get us to that 50 billion number that everybody talks about. And then from a, a sort of an end user perspective, you know, we have seen value in the initial results that we've seen in deploying IoT in our own factories. And uh, you know, we are excited because you know, we think that there is a lot of potential things that we can do, uh, but the, the important thing is to have a cross-functional team and looking at it deploying an infrastructure that allows you to scale and is future-proof. So as you come up with new ideas, or as your customers come up with new use cases, the infrastructure that you've deployed for them has allowed you to get to that point that you can actually meet the requirements. So um, nobody asked any questions, so I'm opening up for questions now. We have, uh, I think, about five minutes. Five minutes? Can you give other examples of some companies out there that did the five tenants or do the five tenants real well? Um, name of companies, uh, of course, National Instruments is, <laughs> is one of them, but uh, um, there are obviously companies coming up with their own IoT platforms. As, as we look at them, uh, most of them are covering elements of these. Um, and you know, I think going back to the, the last bullet on that last slide, and no company really has all five assets within that one company. So that's where really the partnership comes in. And you know, consortium, like you know, industrial IoT um, consortium, um, really helps in bringing that collaboration together from, from the vendors. Hi. <coughs> I'm spraying to the uh, security um, It seems to me that that's the key thing to get right. Uh, and with uh, software development tendency to the cloud, So in, in terms of actually going back to the first point that you made, right, even the cloud data, um, you know, how do you trust that that data that's in the cloud is actually coming from a device that is fully secure? So you can trust that data, you're not doing analytics on the data that's being spoofed, right? And that's really the way we looked at security is, one is around securing the actual end device and making sure that's tamper proof and the data that comes out of it is trusted. The other one is securing the network, right, between the device and the cloud. So things like intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, doing analytics on the traffic data, uh, that's key. And then Yeah, absolutely. And then having a global view of what's happening within the network. And then going to your uh, second question, so again, on the proof of concept, I absolutely agree with you. It's not easy. It's a, it's a big hurdle. In our case, um, it was a, I would say it was a, 
corporate push. Um, you know, uh, I think a lot of people know that uh, we had a real change, uh, a recent change in our CEO that came on, Brian Kazanich, who came on board about 18 months ago. And he has a very make your doer attitude that has been sort of pushing it down to our, um, to our you know, the lowest level of the company. Um, and, you know, he's been sort of, he's, he's a maker himself and he's bring, brought that attitude in. And uh, in these cases, you know, we have actually given out um, IoT gateways and developer platforms, maker platforms to people on the factory floor to come up with ideas and do POCs on their own and come and show their results. And we have actually a thing called, uh, like, are you familiar with Shark Tank on CNBC? Same type of thing, we have actually a panel of judges where actually people come in and present, hey, I went and did this in our factory or in our marketing or in our advertising to prove something, and this is the result of that game, and if you extrapolate, this is what you get. And you have judges that vote on, yeah, I want to put but some money in that. <laughs> right. Right. Well, thank you very much for attending this session. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the night week. I know it's going to be fabulous. Lots of good uh, topics, uh, different tracks. Uh, and enjoy the facilities tonight and tomorrow. One more question. Sure.